dismal days there in the courtroom for Garrett, or Garage Band Garrett, as he was fondly called by some of his friends. He was a good judge, but he just didn't know if this was where he was supposed to be. He didn't know if this was what he was supposed to be doing. He knew the law well, and he doled it out with you know, good judgment and impartiality. He was witty and smart, but more often than not these days, he found himself doing things like staring at the dome in the ceiling and imagining if it were in fact made out of glass, he could see the sun and the clouds slowly drifting by, maybe a, a bird flitting by every now and then, or some sort of, maybe, maybe some days a janitor would walk by and be cleaning the glass in the middle of a case. That would be cool. And what if those windows in the side of the room were much bigger? What if that whole side of the room, the whole side of the courtroom, were entirely glass? And what if there was a, a, a park right there and carefree, uninvolved people were walking around doing all sorts of carefree, uninvolved people stuff? Wow, that would be great. Hmm. Even though he was a fairly important judge, he realized he was just another cog in the whole judicial system. Then he wondered if it was even possible for some cogs to be more important than the others. The whole point of cogs, he supposed, were to be part of the system if you took one out, no matter how important or unimportant the, the, the machine, whatever it was, should grind to a halt. Unless, of course, there were such things as decorative cogs. Were there machines people just liked looking at? And not weird artistic machines either, but something like just some sort of cog that spins on the outside, or maybe some little weird cog that is part of the machine, but just adds a superfluous function that if you remove the cog, the machine keeps working, but that superfluous function is gone. He realized he didn't really know much about cogs, and then he realized he didn't know the difference between cogs and gears, and, and maybe he really had been imagining himself to be a tooth on a gear. Then he realized everyone in the courtroom was waiting for him to say something important. He brought his eyes up from the blurry nothingness he had been lost in, somewhere on the floor between the defense and the prosecution. He began to look at the defense meaningfully through his eyebrows while he thought of something vague to say to give himself more time to figure out what had been going on. Out on the broad front steps of the courthouse, there was a man with a table set up and his wares strewn out before it for sale. His hobby was making tiny oil paintings on canvases about one inch by one inch and then ruining his paintbrushes by, after cleaning them with paint thinner and all that, leaving them in little cups of water in his sink for weeks and weeks until the, the wood of the paintbrushes swelled up and rotted and everything just went south and by the time he got around to wanting to do some more paintings, he needed to buy new paintbrushes and in this manner did he effectively make no money from his hobby, his little artistic endeavors even though he did price his paintings fairly well, and he did sell a fair number of them, mostly to the people that worked at the courthouse and some of the repeat offenders, such as people returning over and over again, trying to get out of traffic violations and infractions, trying not to pay tickets, and then invariably doing so, and on the way out, realizing that they had already spent a great deal of money that day on something they had done wrong, they realized they wanted to spend money on doing something right. And so they'd buy a little piece of art, scarcely bigger than the average polka dot. But that's all right, it didn't matter. It wasn't about the size of the art or the average polka dot or about how grizzled the old man looked. In fact, this was the final spread that he planned to make. If he didn't sell every single little square of art this time, he wouldn't have enough money to buy another set of brushes to ruin. And he only bought the best brushes. That was... Something about it. He had standards, you know. There's no point in ruining brushes if you didn't ruin good ones. Anybody could ruin a bad brush. He tried to make his smile look a little bit less like a grimace and tried to make eye contact with people and did a friendly little wave every now and then and especially tried to make eye contact with people he knew he had sold little pieces of art to before and people that looked like they had perhaps just lost court cases for some reason. Maybe you wouldn't expect it, but like I just said... Those were his most frequent customers. Every time someone that had never seen any of his art before came up to his table, they would hesitate and then grab one of the little pieces, which were all haphazardly scattered about at the moment. There were about 15 of them. And then they would start rotating it around in an effort to figure out which way was up, which way was down, and ultimately, what it was. 
They would ask him what it was, and he never had a good answer for them. But he would ask if they were interested in buying anything, and most of the time they would say no and make their way into the courthouse. And on the way out a few hours later, they would act like he wasn't there, but sometimes they would glance his direction, and he would remember them. He would store their face away in his memory banks, and if they ever came back, whether it was a week later or two years later for something totally unrelated to their first appearance, he would make sure to lay it on thick. And more often than not, they would buy something on the second time they approached the table. And somehow, he did sell all 15 of the remaining pieces and went on to buy some more expensive paintbrushes and ruined them all fantastically. <laughs> 